Hi, I'm Gina, and today I'm going to be walking you through how to build your first agent using AIP Agent Studio. If you've built an agent before using AIP Logic, but you want your users to be able to actually chat with the agent, AIP Agent Studio is a great place to go. Before we get started, a quick word from our founder. Discover how Pounds your customers unlock more value from Foundry and AIP thanks to our live instructor-led trainings. We are Ontologize, a group of former Palantir engineers who love teaching. We've trained thousands of Palantir users at leading organizations around the world. Unlock the full potential of your Palantir deployment by going to ontologize.com. By the end of this exercise, you will have built the following agent. So we have built an FAA or Federal Aviation Administration expert. The Federal Aviation Administration has a handbook for new pilots learning how to fly. And we can ask this questions like, what are hazardous attitudes and their antidotes? Or what are the typical causes of carburetor icing? So if I click on this one, it will populate the question for me. This is really helpful in case users just don't really know what they can ask. And hit send. And here we have our response. We can see some citations from our ontology context, and they look really good. So now that we've discussed what our end product is going to be, let's get to building it. You're going to start out from anywhere in Foundry. Now note that this exercise does have a prerequisite. In a previous video called Preparing PDFs for RAG Workflows, we built an asset that we're going to be needing in this particular exercise. So make sure that you've gone and checked out that video and gone through that exercise before you dive into this one. The asset that you will have built in that previous video you're going to be able to verify that you have it by looking in Ontology Manager or in Object Explorer. Let's go ahead and look in Ontology Manager. You're going to hit Control J and search for Ontology Manager. Click on that. Here we are in Ontology Manager. Hit Search Resources and make sure that you have an object type that's called something like FAA Chunk. So FAA, and that stands for Federal Aviation Administration, chunk. And recall that this object type represents chunks of the FAA's pilot onboarding handbook. You know that you're set up correctly to do this next exercise if you click under Properties and you see that you have, at the very least, an extracted text property and an embedding property. We're going to need both of those properties. The embedding property is for finding the correct text, and the extracted text is for the model to generate its response. Make sure that you have this object type, or as long as you have some other similar object type that also has an embedding property and a plain text property, you can use that one as well. So again, if you have this, we're going to continue onwards, and if you don't have it, you might want to check out that video if you want to follow with this one hands-on. Let's move on to building our agent. From here or from wherever you are, you're going to hit Control J and search for AIP Agent Studio. And click on AIP Agent Studio. You're going to hit New AIP Agent. And you have choices here. Your choice is between a standard agent and an AIP Assist agent. In this case, you're going to choose a standard agent. So make sure you have that one selected and hit continue. Let's give our agent a name. So call this one, your name, FAA or Federal Aviation Administration expert. Talk to you about flight training. An agent is a resource just like everything else is and it needs to live in a location. So hit select a location hit browse, go up to your project where you're doing your work. And I'm going to save this A in my project. Now you're going to hit create AIP agent. Here we are in our AIP agent. Nothing's configured, but let's take a little tour of the UI. In the middle here, you're going to have your chat. On this side, we'll see some high-level metrics like how many sessions, how many users, how many sessions are marked helpful, how many are marked unhelpful, average sessions per user, and some other metadata. You can also upload a picture if you like. 
the agent configuration because that's where most of our work is going to happen. First up, you have the choice of model. Here are all the models you can select from. We're going to keep this at GPT-41. Next, we have the instruction. So this is the system prompt. This is going to describe the role of the agent in the context of the current application. We'll get to that later. Up next, we have the temperature. A higher temperature is going to make the responses more random. Retrieval context is where we're going to be spending most of our time. A retrieval context is going to give your agent more context and more information with every single message. There are four different types of retrieval context. Document context, ontology context, a function back context, and custom documentation context. We're going to be talking about these first two, but specifically, we're going to be using ontology context, and we'll go into more detail about why that is versus document context. Up next, we have tools. For the tools, you might recognize some of these if you've built an agent using AIP logic before. An AIP agent built in AIP Agent Studio can apply an action just like an agent in AIP logic can, can call a function, and can perform an object query. It can also update the application variable. So that is for if you are embedding your AIP agent in, say, a workshop application, and you want your AIP agent to be able to talk to the workshop where it lives. That is what that is for. You can allow it to request clarification. And then there's ontology semantic search, which you should not use because it is legacy. Up next, we have citations. When you're using a document in ontology context, by default, you're going to get citations. And that's going to link to the source material when citations are toggled on. And finally, we have the application state. We talked briefly about the application state earlier. So the application state allows your agent to talk to the application where it lives. So for example, if it's reading variables from the workshop where it is, or if it has to write back to variables in the workshop, that is all managed in the application state. Let's begin with some instructions. So let's have a system prompt. You are a friendly and knowledgeable flight instructor. Answer the user's question in simple but helpful terms. A simple prompt here. Of course, you can experiment with personalities and more. And you can also invoke tools in application state if you have them, which we don't. And you can do that by hitting a forward slash. Now, up next, we're going to make this much more useful by giving it a retrieval context. Retrieval context is information that is, again, available with every single message. Whereas with a tool, if we look at the tools, something like an object query is one way to get more information. But that's a tool that may or may not get used. And it's certainly not information that's available with every single message. To get information or context with every message, you have to use the retrieval context for that. Let's click on Add Retrieval Context. And we'll discuss Document Context and Ontology Context. To provide document context, all we need to actually provide are documents. Whereas for ontology context, we have to provide some sort of chunk object type. So some object type where each object represents a fraction of the text and also has an embedding. Why would we use one or the other? Document context might seem a little easier. All we have to do is bring in some PDFs and drop them in. You would use document context if the information you're giving the agent is only really going to be useful for this agent specifically. Giving a document context doesn't really create a data asset. It just gives this specific agent access to that information. Whereas when you create an ontology context, that context is now available across your entire stack for other users to make use of, to build other agents, say an AIP logic or other AIP agent studio agents. The other benefit of ontology context and what makes this a better pattern to follow is that your organization's knowledge corpus, all of the text and audio recordings and text sort and images that make up the foundational knowledge within your organization, it does not exist in isolation. All of that unstructured knowledge can be associated with more structured information. For example, in our theme park data, we have chunks of ride manuals that are associated with rides. 
In this situation, we have chunks of the FAA handbook, which could be associated with, say, a pilot certificate, or a knowledge test, or a course. There's many different ways that we might want to model our organization that could involve establishing relationships between structured information and less structured information. And that is part of the benefit of investing in building an ontology context rather than simply using the document context. So with that being said, we're going to hit ontology context and search for your name, FAA, or whatever you call this object type. Remember, this is the object type that you will have made as a prerequisite to this exercise in the prior video. FAA chunk. Confirm selection. We're not done yet. We still have to do some additional configuration here. Click into Gina, FAA chunk, or whatever yours is called. And let's set up some retrieval settings. First of all, note that the ontology context can be a static object set or a variable. If we're feeding in, for example, an object set from the workshop where this agent is deployed, then we could have a variable object set for the ontology context. In this case, it's static. It's just the FAA chunks. The question is, which objects do we want to grab? Probably not all of them, and probably not some arbitrary subset. Instead, we want to use the relevant objects. So click on relevant objects. And this is why we put the work into building that embedding property. Click on it, select a property, and it's going to be embedding. For the maximum number of objects to load, 20 is fine. You can change this limit depending on how you see fit with your specific use case. You can toggle on enable query writing. That's going to enable the LLM to rewrite the user query before retrieval using the last three exchanges. This can make the results of your semantic search better. You can also set a relevancy threshold. This is totally optional. So the value has to be between zero and one. But remember that a semantic search is never really going to tell you no. If I ask a question that has nothing to do with flying or something marginally having to do with flying, like what is the habitat for a flying squirrel? It's going to give me results, still going to give me 20 results, but they're not going to be very good. And so what I can do is assign a relevancy threshold to make sure that we don't get any garbage results if there just isn't a good semantic relationship between the query and the knowledge corpus. Lastly, you do have the option to create an objects and output variable to store the most relevant objects based on these results. Now we've set this up properly, let's take it for a spin. We're going to start by asking it a question. Let's ask the question like, can you explain the PAVE checklists? And we're reasoning. We're doing the semantic search. And we have our friendly and simple response. So P... AVE stands for pilot in command, aircraft. V stands for environment. E stands for external pressure. And note that we have our sources. And they look really relevant. So we can see that it is properly using our knowledge corpus or our chunked FAA documents to answer these questions. Let's try another one. Let's ask a question like, can you explain... Bernoulli's principle in the context of lift. It's thinking. And then we have our answer. And here we have these cited chunks, and they look about right. Now that we're comfortable with our agent, and of course, you can do more iteration on the system prompt if you want it to be responding differently or in more details. Before we save and publish, let's go over to the conversation settings. The conversation settings, we can choose between 24 in activity expiration, or we can do indefinite retention. We're going to keep this at a 24 hour in activity expiration for now. Lastly, some people might not know what they can ask an agent. It can be helpful to have an input placeholder or some starting prompts. We'll add a couple of starting prompts. So let's have a question like, 
what are hazardous attitudes and their antidotes? These are all various flight training questions. What are the typical causes of carburetor icing? And maybe just one more. How do you read a takeoff performance chart? You also have the option to suggest follow-up prompts. And here we can see how their starting prompts show up. And so that can be helpful if users just don't quite know what to do yet with an agent, and that can help them get comfortable talking to one. Now we're happy with our configuration. Up next, we have evaluation. Note that to evaluate an agent, you're actually going to have to publish it as a function. So that's not something we're going to cover right now, but here is the option. We have the versioning and we can see the usage. Now we're gonna hit save and publish. And now we publish the version of our agent. This most likely is not where your users are going to interact with this agent. If you click on view and view version one, you can see the view mode for your agent. So that gets rid of all of the different configurations that you really don't want your end users to see. But it's a lot more common to embed the agent in a workshop. And so that's the last thing that we're going to do. So hit Control J and search for workshop. Click on workshop. Hit blank module. And call this one FAA agent app and hit save. We'll delete this section on the left. We don't need it. In the middle here, hit add widget, search for AIP agent, and click on AIP agent interactive widget. Click on that. Don't worry about this error. We're going to fix it. Hit select on the right. And you'll see your agent in your recent files, so Gina, FAA expert, and hit select. We can also delete this section heading. And of course, you can always make your app a little fancier. The benefit of embedding your AIP agent in a workshop application is oftentimes your workflow is not going to be solely composed of a user chatting with an agent. And so that's the point of the exercise of deploying this into an app. Now you're gonna hit save and publish. And that concludes our work. Thanks for watching, we hope you found this helpful. Let us know what sort of AIP questions you have in the comments.